Welcome to the 14th episode of the Lebanese uh, Physicians uh, Podcast. Uh, and today our guest is Dr. Uh, Joseph uh, Al-Khouri, who is a uh, specialist psychiatrist who graduated from the United Kingdom and uh, worked at the National Health Service and then moved to Lebanon in 2012 and subsequently joined the American University of Beirut Medical Center, where he was assistant professor of medicine. He was running the psychiatry residency program at the university, which is the only uh, program in the region, I think, that is uh, IACGME accredited. And uh, he, is, uh, he is specialized in addiction medicine, uh, conflict medicine, and psychosis. And in fact, he established a psychosis outreach center at uh, the American University of Europe Medical Center, uh, which is uh, the only center of Lebanon in Lebanon, which takes care of severe mental disorders. Welcome, Joseph, to the podcast. Thank you, Khalil, for the opportunity and for the nice format, I hope uh, your listeners will enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. So, uh, yeah, today we will be majorly discussing, I think, the practice of psychiatry in Lebanon and uh, the impact of the recent events in Lebanon that all of us know on uh, the psychological well-being of uh, the people and even the physicians in the country. So, uh, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions first. As you were in the UK, you were working there. What prompted you to move back to Lebanon? Um, I, obviously, it was, you know, as you said, 2012, which sounds like... Uh, it is a decade ago. Um, and at the time, I had finished my training. I had gotten a job as a consultant psychiatrist in the UK. A consultant position is really kind of uh, the end point of, uh, of your, your, your training career and the start of kind of the next step where you're, uh, uh, you're establishing yourself managerially and clinically. And uh, I decided that I needed to make a big decision. You know, I was probably in my uh, probably early 30s and I thought either I stay in the UK and that's it for me or I go back to Lebanon, which was originally the intention when I left, you know, 14 years before. Uh, and I felt, well, you know, you need to, you need to, you know, you need to keep that promise you made to yourself to at least try to come back to Lebanon. And at the time also, uh, I was in a relationship in Lebanon. I had... Uh, my family. So I had reasons to come back as, as well on a personal level. But mostly it was the idea that, you know, we trained, we did everything we needed, and now we could go and possibly, you know, give back, but also uh, develop our uh, our career on a, on a personal level. Yeah, that, that's, that's, I think all of us, all of us uh, think this way. And I, I know when you move back, psychiatry service in Lebanon have been progressing over time, right? So I, I know there was it was it was a taboo at one point, and people were always hesitant to go to a psychiatrist because it was something that they felt if they told other people it would look bad. So is it still the same now, or do you think things have moved forward in the country in terms of of that? Uh, definitely, they moved forward, and I think you know we should give credit and you know feel positive about certain things, even in the time that I was there. Things kept evolving, but by, you know, by 2012, a lot of work had been done by many of, the, of my colleagues and by many associations to move things forward. I think mental health in general had been neglected, but had also been diverted. So people were seeking help, but were seeking help possibly in the wrong direction or doing some self-help. So a lot of self-treatment, a lot of self-medication. Uh, and then, you know, services were growing. Most psychiatrists were coming back from abroad. Uh, the local residency programs were also developing. AUB started its program. I think the first graduates were uh, soon after I joined. Uh, and that was the first time AUB had graduated its own residence since possibly the days of uh, Asfuri beforehand. Um, also, you had uh, St. George's Hospital, Mr. Farroum. Uh, you had Hotel Dieu that had grown into a proper academic department. So all these things had happened, and uh, we were more visible. Mental health, psychologists, psychiatrists were more uh, available on TV stations, in the media. And um, I remember very well that when I came back, uh, people you know, were surprised that I would even be able to actually you know, make an income, that they felt that psychiatry was going to be uh, you know, me uh, sitting by myself and maybe getting occasionally a patient as opposed to really, you know, growing into the services that uh, we develop at later stages. So the need was, was big, awareness was growing, and, uh, and things were looking very good until recently. Exactly. And, uh, and have, have the services started to be covered by insurance? Because I know for a while they were 
uh, not covered and people had to pay out of pocket for psychiatric services. It is still unfortunately the case. Insurance companies in Lebanon, uh, I think, are very a, a part of the problem and they've been addressed repeatedly by the Lebanese Psychiatric Society, by uh, clinicians, by uh, patients. And uh, it's probably one of the very few countries in the developed world or semi-developed world where insurance companies completely ignore uh, the role of the psychiatrist in healthcare. And interestingly, paradoxically, the government does better than the private sector when it comes to mental health. So things like the NSSF, Daman, anything to do with Ministry of Health actually does better to cover medication and certain types of treatment much better than the private sector. And even up till then, up till now, I think if it wasn't for what the, the public sector was doing uh, through outsourcing, so mostly it's not services delivered by the public sector, but it's the public sector paying for services outside, paying badly, paying low fees, but still paying something, which is not what's happening with the, with the private sector. And that's something hopefully when we hopefully come out of this crisis, maybe insurance companies, if they really want to help mental health in Lebanon, should start by actually covering the cost of it instead of, of uh, helping, you know, doing, uh, raising awareness. Right, exactly. Raising awareness is important, but also covering the cost is important because it, it will give more people uh, the ability to go see a psychiatrist if they need to, because probably right now it is very hard for them to do, to do so. And uh, yeah, before we get into the recent events in Lebanon, I know you're a conflict medicine specialist, uh, and uh, an addiction specialist. And I see that you've published uh, a lot of papers on these topics uh, during your time in the UK and in Lebanon. So can you tell us a bit more about uh, what uh, conflict medicine psychiatry is and, and how addiction medicine also in psychiatry is? Okay, I mean, interestingly, uh, the two, although separate, can actually combine because a time of conflict, um, addiction and uh, abuse and trauma, all these combine actually to create this, uh, this slightly chaotic uh, social situation. Uh, my interest in conflict medicine probably stems, I would say, without being too analytical from the experience I lived as a child and that many of us lived in, in Lebanon, growing in one of the ugliest war, uh, wars of the, 21st, of the 20th century. You know, if the Syrian war is one of the ugliest so far in the 21st century, we tend to forget that ours was one was the kind of ep 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 epitome uh, war of the 20th century. And that, uh, so when I, when I uh, by the time I became a psychiatrist and I started training and reading, and I always wondered, you know, how does what I learn and that happens in very sophisticated systems of care, how do we translate this into countries like Lebanon where you have wars, when you have the amount of trauma is beyond anything you would be able to treat through traditional uh, means and also having actually encountered many people who had uh, taken part in the war, you know, the generation above us, uh, slightly older, uh, but even some, you know, within my age group had actually taken active part or been victims. So that, uh, that interested me from the beginning. So uh, after I completed my training, my formal training, I decided that I wanted to do a, mas a master's in uh, war and psychiatry, which is a very unique program at King's College London that, that, trains you and uh, sort of uh, uh, provides insight into how conflict psychiatry or military psychiatry, because most of conflict psychiatry so far up till now has, has been the, the psychiatry of, of military uh, forces, especially uh, US, UK, uh, you know, World War I, II, et cetera. And a lot of it then was translated into uh, services for, uh, for the sort of the civilian population. But very little was done about people like me or my family or uh, refugees and, and trying to understand what exactly needs to be done for us to provide daily high quality evidence-based uh, uh, psychiatric care for these people. And also when I come back, came back to Lebanon in 2012, I worked with Médecins Sans Frontières uh, on the Lebanese-Syrian border. I was uh, the psychiatrist in the town of Arsel, which obviously is a famous or infamous town where uh, you had all these events. And I, I was just there you know, probably a few months before the, the peak of the events. And, and that also was very enlightening. So my research is a lot about trying to understand and trying to gather the evidence for what we can do as psychiatrists trained in the West and trained in sophisticated healthcare when we come back to countries that are unstable and especially in the Middle East. Right. And, I, and, and you've had since 2012 till now, I think there's been uh, quite a bit of instability uh, probably 2014, 2015, with the car bombing situations that were going on. 
But more recently, with with everything that went on in Lebanon, and I think it was three separate crises that went on at the same time, including the socioeconomic crisis, uh, which came on sort of suddenly, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic issue. And then this was all topped with the uh, August 4th uh, Beirut blast, which I think everybody has has heard about. So how has this, how has have you how have you seen these situations impact the psychological well-being of the people in Lebanon and also the the medical students, the residents, and the doctors over there? Uh, I, I can easily say that uh, what, what you just described, very few populations have been through them in time of peace. You know, in time of war. It's different because, you know, people prepare themselves gradually to kind of encounter all these events. And generally, it's a kind of, uh, you know, there's a social network, a social contract that almost accepts that these things are going to are gonna happen. Uh, that wasn't the case in Lebanon. You know, we're living in relative instability, but nothing we had not encountered in the last 20, 30 years, roughly since the end of the formal civil war. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we got on with things. Occasionally, once or twice a year, we'd have an event like an assassination or the rest of it. But this, this combination of uh, almost, I would say, epic proportion, I mean, it reminds me a bit of the sort of uh, 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 the flood of the Bible and all the sort of bad things that keep happening. But instead of happening in series, they happen in parallel. And then you have to kind of deal with them. So again, mental health, a lot of people had expectation that mental health services or, or professionals would be able to do something about it. And indeed, we did. We did on individual levels. We did uh, in terms of providing support, again, providing uh, awareness on a public level, uh, managing as, as well as we could. But you cannot resolve uh, a social problem via uh, clinical interventions solely. Clinical interventions obviously are focused on the extreme cases of any uh, psychosocial manifestation of distress or, or, or uh, anxiety or depression. And we're seeing a lot of this. And again, uh, as you said earlier, the economic uh, hurdle was major for people to actually seek help and for the doctor to sustain himself, to be able to offer the help that these people needed. And by the time we reached uh, probably, I would say, the summer of 2020, uh, we had a shortage of medication. We had uh, a problem with being able to understand how we would charge for our fees in a meaningful way, especially parts of institutions, but also people in private practice. Uh, and also people were, were being, you know, doctors like me and others were being accused of not being uh, humane enough. But at the same time, we have the dilemma of being able to having to look after our families and after our own uh, uh, well-being. So all these came together. And August 4th, that day, which I lived on a personal level and many Lebanese will never forget. Uh, and again, I'm somebody, again, who lives through the war, who lives through bombings. Uh, but the the scale of what happened that afternoon uh, just made us all feel very unsafe, and I think will continue to make us feel very unsafe for a very long time, especially in the, with the lack of accountability, because safety on a personal level or on a social level needs accountability, needs the guarantee that things are not going to happen again. And unfortunately, nothing changed for us to be able to guarantee that nothing will happen again. So all these things create this you know, this, this chaotic situation where people are trying to, uh, you know, to plaster their, their wounds, but really healing is, is very difficult to achieve in, this, in these conditions. Right. I mean, I, I, I was there also on August 4th, and, and the scenes I saw in the emergency department at that time were, were undescribable. And, and I'm actually surprised, or probably people, I don't know if you, what your thoughts are, but I feel that people, some people have been able to uh, move on or at least uh, heal partially uh, after after this event. Do you think do you think that is true, or do you think that the scars are still there, but people are just used to it in Lebanon and they try to to forget about it and move on and, and move on with their lives? It's an interesting question because, uh, especially on social media, because there was you know the eight months uh, you know anniversary, and there's a whole debate around you know don't forget versus we need to move on. And you know, you know, heal, and and it's almost mutually exclusive. But in reality, you know, we can actually have closure and heal without forgetting. There are ways for us to do that. But again, it needs to be linked to hope. It needs to be linked to better things happening. It needs to be linked to better memories. And the Lebanese were not able to get these things. You know, they were not able to provide themselves with a with a healing space. Now. A lot of people are not necessarily in denial, but I would say 
uh, have this um, ability to kind of put things in a, in a, in a closet and, and keep it wrapped. But ultimately, whatever happened that day must have changed us. And it might be that we will not realize how it changed us until many, many years down the line. Okay, And I can see it sometimes in very small behaviors. Uh, and, and the best indicators of these, interestingly, are children. Uh, people who have children are the ones who will tell you, uh, you know, I, I've seen very clear changes in my children because children don't hide things. You know, they're very candid about uh, things. But I think in adults, we all change in some way. We all possibly enjoy things less or uh, feel, again, you know, this sense of safety that people in the West or other countries take for granted. We don't have it. So we wake up in the morning and this idea that at any point you could die is not a, is not a normal you know, feeling. It's not a normal feeling when you're in your 20s or 30s or 40s or even some when you're 70s or 80s. But it, it, it accompanies us where we go. And it's a very ugly feeling that probably colors the way society is in Lebanon generally. And, uh, you know, Corona did in a way um, help create a certain buffer zone because we're all living our life less. But once you go back to living it fully, I think the scars will be very uh, visible for people to notice. I can tell you my experience, like when, when I moved back to the U.S., that like you don't feel it when you're there. But once once you get to a sort of stable situation, you feel that you were very anxious when you were there and you feel that things are suddenly you feel more at peace. Or I don't know if you had that feeling when you moved to Dubai, too, in terms of you feel that your anxiety level has gone down significantly. I don't know if you felt, if you had the feeling. Yeah, I mean, I did to a certain extent. Obviously, my family is in Beirut, so it's yeah. raising my anxiety even more because right. I feel that I can't protect them if anything happened. But you're right, you know. Um, it's almost also there's that feeling of anger and resentment that the rest of the world, for them, they did not have to live this experience. And, you know, ultimately you telling them about it is almost like them watching a movie or a Netflix uh, a series, you know. But for us, it's very real. And, and I feel, again, uh, our ability to connect, hopefully, around this, uh, this, this event positively as a country will depend on how we move forward in terms of creating a, a safe country for ourselves, which obviously de depends on reforms, depending also on, on, uh, on many things that we're still not seeing. So we're not able to bond even over these things. We, we still have the, you know, the, the, the disagreement over what happened. We still have the, all the anger back and forth. All these have impact. And people, again, will see them gradually impacting on them unless there's a national healing process happening, uh, hopefully very soon, because it might be too late three or four years down the line. Right. And, and, and as, you, as you mentioned, I think accountability is a huge part of this process. Like you need to know what happened and what caused this. And so, I, I, I mean, as, as we discussed throughout this podcast, I think you you have had a very successful practice in Lebanon. You actually uh, are are the incoming. I don't know if you're still going to be, but you're the incoming president of the Lebanese Psychiatric uh, Society, right? And so, I, I mean, I, I'm going to ask you this question, but we've discussed it already. What prompted you to, uh, after all this time and with all this success that you had, what prompted you to to pack up and and move to Dubai? Uh, obviously, I would be lying if I wouldn't say the income played a very big part of it, because uh, you know, again, at, at the stage of my career, I you know I'm considered probably a mid-career doctor, as they call it. You know that you're no longer trying to establish yourself, but you also have the energy and the kind of uh, the passion for 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 medicine and for developing things. We've put a lot of effort creating again services, creating networks, uh, making changes, and suddenly it all felt that. It would, could all collapse in, in one go. And, and for me, on a personal level, uh, I call it, you know, alienation. I mean, it's a very interesting word that uh, they use uh, uh, in sort of political economy. And there's the idea that I have no control over my life, over my fate. I have no, and now I have no control over my money. You know, before it was more existential. It was more about the politics. But suddenly, even my income meant nothing to my lifestyle. I could not even translate my income, the numbers on the screen in a reality for me and my family. And I, you know, I had a, a, my first child about three months ago. And for me, again, when you get a child, that changes again, you know, your, your sense of priorities. And I felt that me sitting behind, waiting for a hope that I do not believe in would be almost criminals 
a criminal thing to do to my uh, to my daughter. Now, I, d- I have not given up on Lebanon totally, and I'm still obviously affiliated with AUB, and I, I'm still going to become the, the president of the LPS, hopefully, in the next two months. And I do intend to, uh, uh, to kind of carry my mandate forward uh, fully. And, you know, what's nice with technology these days and with a lot of our colleagues being abroad, that we can actually still make a change. And I'm not going to lose my connection with Lebanon. But I also hope that within a year from now, that there will be some sense of control that me and my colleagues and others in Lebanon would be able to get back to give us, you know, the, the impulse to, to return physically to the country because mentally we haven't left. But, you know, after a few years, you will leave. You cannot sit in Lebanon mentally and physically elsewhere beyond a couple of years. It's just unnatural and creates more anxiety, actually. Right, exactly, exactly. And that, that was my, my last question for you was, seems like a lot of a lot of the doctors are leaving i mean for me it was the impact was not as as bad as i mean i was there for only two years you were there for a much longer period of time but but it's very hard to leave i think a lot of us have taken that uh, that decision uh, because of the things that we discussed right now i mean what do you think is the future of psychiatry in lebanon the future of medicine in lebanon if things do not uh, change to the better soon I mean, as you said, leaving the second time is more painful, much more painful. When I left the first time, I was 20 and I was going to, you know, to create my career, to train. So that's exciting. So I'm not, I'm not upset for the residents who are going. I'm not upset for the medical students who are going because that's normal. That's natural. It's always been the case in Lebanon. What, I'm wor- what really upsets me is to see people who came back, who were successful in their countries of training, came back and gave a lot and now... I feel that, again, if this lasts beyond a year or two, they will simply give up completely uh, on returning. And then we're going to have a gap of, of a mid-career doctors who are, again, the backbone of, of, of training, of, of, uh, of uh, the, the sort of uh, enthusiasm for the, for the practice. And these people are not going to come back. A big chunk of them are not going to come back, especially the ones going to Europe and the U.S., but also a lot of the residents who are finishing now are not coming back. So you're going to have actually two gaps at two levels. And, you know, we created a psychiatry resident program in Lebanon to have psychiatrists work in Lebanon. And looking at some of the residents that are just graduating, I, I simply cannot encourage them to come back now before we create the opportunities. And I hope that I will be somebody who will be taking part in creating these opportunities. Because me coming back in 2012, I basically had to find my own feet by myself and there were no real networks to support me. And, uh, and I fear that this will happen as well to a lot of these young doctors who want to come back or enthusiastic and patriotic. And, you know, I don't think us being not, not physically in Lebanon makes us less patriotic than others. I just think it's about how we live our exile between brackets. Right. I agree. I agree. And how do you think people can help uh, psychiatric service in Lebanon right now? Because I'm sure they're needed more than ever before and people probably don't have the money to to access these services so how do you think what's a good way to to help out with this for expats uh, Lebanese expats or expat physicians from Lebanon uh, I think a lot you know despite us a lot many of us leaving uh, there are around 70 psychiatrists in Lebanon and I would say around probably between 15 to 20 would probably have left or are leaving at some point, which leaves a very small number of, of doctors. Now, these doctors, obviously, some of them work in private clinics, some of them work in hospitals and academic centers. Uh, and yes, you're right, it's expensive. But at the same time, a lot of my colleagues are still taking what could be considered really uh, very small fees because that's how they keep the number of patients up, but also because they have you know, a humanistic, at least, approach to things. I would say for doctors abroad, for colleagues abroad, if we want to support people, we need to be able to support them staying in Lebanon, okay? Whether that's through direct financial support, whether it's through uh, supporting uh, even their salaries, but also through supporting training and, uh, uh, and anything that will help residents, for example, get exposure abroad without having to travel completely and, and uh, leaving the system uh, completely. Before, a few years ago, some of our doctors used to go for the US or the UK or Europe for, for a month or two. Now, these people have to pay out of their own pocket. So I would say setting up a fund, helping people, uh, continuing training, using technology, all these could be helpful to keep psychiatry floating at least at a certain level until it picks up again and hopefully gets becomes uh, better than it used to be uh, a few years ago. Thank you, Dr. Al-Khouri. This was a great discussion on, and 
uh, hopefully people learn more about the psychiatric services in Lebanon and the impact of uh, the socioeconomic situation and the, and the blast uh, on the psychological well-being of people, uh, people there. And hopefully people will be able to help uh, support the people who are uh, still there at this point. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Khalil, for this opportunity again. And uh, hopefully we'll do it again and talk about nicer things in the future. Right, hopefully. We all both hope. Okay. So.